Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to those who are here in our beautiful sanctuary. Welcome to those of you who are joining us via Facebook and YouTube. This is the third Sunday of Easter. Easter is not one day, it's a 50-day journey that we take from the cross to Pentecost. So here's our opening question for today. Are you ready? Okay, all right. Are we Easter people? Yes. Yes, we are. And so let's then begin this day of worship by assuring each other that Christ is alive and gives us his peace. As you feel comfortable, share the peace with your neighbor with the words, He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Share the peace. Move around. Once you get the idea, it comes back, doesn't it? What a wonderful sound. Hey, I've got a question for the kids this morning, for the Sunday school. Do you know who made the trees? Anybody know? Who? Mother Nature, what a great answer, okay. Does anybody know who made the birds? Yeah, who? Who? Did anybody say God? Yeah, good answer. How about uh, the flowers? Who made the flowers? Yep. Mother Nature did that too? Okay. What about puppies? Anybody know who made puppies? Oh, trick question. God did. Yay. How about rhododendrons? Who made those? <laughs> well, I can tell you it was God. And God just made the whole world. And Mother Nature is a big helper for God. And here's the last question. Do you know who made you? God, good answer. All right. God made everything and everybody in the world. And we're celebrating Earth Day all this week. And I think, uh, I think you might be talking about that in Sunday school maybe too. Anyway, Sharon, do you happen to have a song that could lead us into that? And I have a question for you guys. Did you guys enjoy your earthworms last week? Oh, they weren't really earthworms, were they? What were they? Kind of worms. Gummy worms. Gummy worms in mud. Awesome. You guys had a lot of fun last week with that. So he's got the whole world in his hands. Can you join me with that? Come on up. Come on up. Yeah. 
job. All right, now before you go down, why don't you stay here and we'll say a prayer together first, okay? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for making trees and birds and puppies and rhododendrons. Thank you for making us show us how to help you by looking after this world better. Yeah, in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Sharon. We're going to begin this day of worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name, amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please rise as you're able, and we'll sing our opening hymn, Morning Has Broken.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O oh God, your Son makes himself known to all his disciples in the breaking of bread. Open the eyes of our faith that we may see him in his redeeming work. He who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. Good morning. The third Sunday after Easter, our first reading from the book of Acts, chapter 2, 14a. Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they would cut to their hearts and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all those who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save ourselves from this corruption generation. Those who accept the message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their names that day. Today, um, I guess it's Psalm 116, verses 1 to 4 and 12 to 17, and this is found on page 272, and we'll read whole verses responsively. I love the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supp supplication, because he has inclined his ears to me whenever I call upon him. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray for you, I pray you, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and the righteous. Our God is full of compassion. 
I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of ill, sorry, of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his servants. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant and the child of your handmaid. You will freed me from my bonds. I will offer you a sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Amen. Our second reading is from Peter's first letter, chapter 4. 1 verse 17 to 23 since you called on your father who judges each person's work impartially live out your time as a foreigner here in reverent fear for you know that he has not for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver and gold that you were redeemed from the empty ways of life handed down from, you, from your ancestors. But with precious blood of Christ and the lamb without blemishes or defects, he has chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourself by obeying the, tr the truth so that you have sincere, sincere your love for each other, love for one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perished, perishable seeds, but of imperishable throughout the living and enduring the word of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 24th chapter. Now that same day, two of Jesus' friends were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked him, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these last days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what's more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they'd seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see Jesus. And Jesus said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? 
and beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up, and they returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it's true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. And then the two friends told them what happened on their way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. So we've had an earthquake shake up the world. Do you remember that on Easter morning? We've had, re thank you for a one yes, yes. We've had, one, we've had random meetings with the risen Lord in a garden, in a locked room by the seashore. Today we have a chance to walk with Jesus down a country road. Now, this week I measured the distance between the Parsonage and Walmart in Hanover. And in case you didn't know, it's about nine and a half miles. So think of a walk from here to about Bucks Crossing. That's, that's about seven miles. The distance two friends were walking that day. And remember what day it was. It was Easter Day. Passover is done, the tomb is empty, and Cleopas is walking with a friend. Some scholars say it was another man. Some suggest it might have been his wife. We don't really know. We never find out the name of the second person. But they're heading for home, back from Jerusalem, talking about their weekend. We don't get exact details from the Bible, but practically speaking, we know walking gives us a fairly safe space to talk about our fears and our frustrations, our joys and our concerns, and while we might not be able to solve all the problems of the world, the combination of physical activity and talking to someone else or listening to someone else allows all that pent-up stuff to be released. Every therapist will confirm this fact. So these friends are sad. They're lost, they're depressed, they're demoralized. Every hope and dream and prayer has been squashed. The one they'd been counting on was dead and his body had vanished. Seriously, would we have been any different in our reaction? I don't think so. So then, this stranger comes along and the two friends seem eager to share their troubled conversation with him. Here's what happened. Here's what our friends saw. Here's how people are feeling now. But we had hoped. We had hoped. He was supposed to be the one to liberate us. We had hoped. And the stranger makes that one comment about them being a little bit dim. And he takes over the conversation. It's almost like he's saying, friends, you know this. Remember? 
And he tells them God's love story from the very beginning. And here's why I think these two friends were Lutheran, okay? Because they get home and they invite this stranger to stay with them for supper. It's always about the food for us, isn't it? So why do you think Jesus sticks around? What's the point, really? Well, he's done everything required of him, hasn't he? He's done the cross. He's risen from the dead. What more could possibly have been expected of him that he feels it's necessary to make these seemingly random appearances to his disciples, first at the tomb, then in a locked room, and now some seven miles away as his friends are going home? Well, we could speculate. And we could say that his followers needed more lessons on trusting Jesus, on trusting his promises. We could guess that he was disappointed in their betrayals and generally poor displays of faith through the past few days. And so he's come back to scold them for poor performances. We might think him justified in coming back and taking revenge on those who tried to destroy him. But that wasn't his style. That's not the way he did business before the cross, and I don't think that was his intention after the cross either. I have the feeling Jesus kept popping up all over the place simply and purely for the joy of it. He loves these people. He spent his entire earthly life with them, and, and he just likes hanging out. Jesus loves spending time with his friends. There's nothing that gives him more delight than when he's talking with you. And when he's laughing with you. And even when he's crying with you, because that's what true friends do. I've mentioned this before, but I'll say it again, and those who attended the midweek Lenten discussions will bear witness to what I'm about to say. We were talking about our images of God. Who do we see when we think about God? And there were a variety of, of, of really good answers, of course. But when I asked, what do you think God sees when he looks at you? the answers were all dismally sad. He sees a naughty kid. He sees a bad person. He sees someone who's stubborn. He sees someone who refuses to listen. He sees someone who is unrepentant, and the list went on. But when I used biblical language, like, what about that you are his beloved? What about that you are heirs of God's kingdom? What about that you are loved unconditionally? What about that you are made in the image of God? Those biblical facts were just too foreign to be embraced by the group, and I suspect by most people here as well. But at the table, when the two weary friends sat down with this stranger, when they met together in the breaking of the bread, in the very ordinary, everyday stuff, there is surprise, there is joy, there's absolute heartfelt delight for both parties. I think Jesus is having as much fun as these two friends. The scene at supper is almost reminiscent of Holy Communion, but it's not really communion in this story. It's just supper. But it reminds us of communion. And oh, how I wish I could convince you of what joy there is to share a meal with your best friend every time we gather here. 
when we bring our stuff to the table, all our joys, all our sorrows, all our challenges, all our victories, all our tears and laughter, all of who we are, when we share that, there's joy for both the giver and the receiver at the table. A delight that comes from knowing you are loved and you are safe and you are welcome. That's what happened in Luke's story. And that's what happens at this table. Jesus is there in, with, and through the bread and the wine. At the table is how and where and when and why the friends finally recognize him. For him to see our joy and for him to share that joy, I have a feeling that could be one of the reasons he stuck around and dropped in on his friends the way he did. Almost every story Luke tells, Jesus is either going to eat, or he's coming from eating, or he's cooking for his friends to eat, or he's serving food to eat. Maybe Jesus was Lutheran too, who knows? But here's a challenge for you. Have you ever struck up a conversation with someone and, and told them how much you love Jesus or how much he loves you? I think I've told you this too, but one time going through a checkout, the cashier somehow started telling me about how joyful her life was because of Jesus. And I stood there mesmerized. Right? I mean, maybe the people behind me in the lineup weren't so happy, but that kind of joy is infectious, and it's ours to share. Jesus shows up in Emmaus. Jesus shows up in Aten. Jesus shows up wherever we are gathered. And we, too, may have our own misconceptions about what a Messiah should be and do. But he says to us, friends, you know this. Remember? You might have thought I'd do things differently, but this is the Savior you need. And this is the Savior you get. So walk with me. And share a meal with me. And talk with me. And let's be delighted in each other's company. Your eyes will be opened to a world filled with joy. And so with that, we can truly and actually say with the disciples, we have seen the Lord. We've experienced the very presence of Jesus, and we do go out with joy because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Let's rise and sing our next hymn, We Walk by Faith and Not by Sight.
We use the words of the Apostles' Creed to confess the faith in which we live. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated as the choir sings, Loaves were broken, words were spoken. United in the hope and love of the resurrection, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Ever-present God, we pray for our bishops, Susan and Michael, 
and for communities of faith gathered in your name today. You make yourself known in the breaking of the bread and in the bonds of community. Reveal yourself to us in the faces of all we meet. Strengthened by your body and blood, let us boldly live out your good news. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. As we know you in the breaking of bread, we know you in the grains of the field and the flowing waters. Care for the earth you lovingly create. Strengthen those who safeguard threatened land and water. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You are the authority to whom we dedicate our lives. Help us keep the needs of those most vulnerable at the forefront of our community. Move us to care for any who are disregarded or oppressed. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Mothering God, you feed and comfort those who hunger. Open the hearts of those who hoard resources and lead them to share your abundance. We pray for anyone hungering for your comforting presence this day, especially Tammy, Pastor Christine, Laverne, Judith, Sharon, Wayne, Carol. We pray for all who feel alone, all who live with mental health issues or addictions, all who wait for tests, results, and treatments, and all those we name in our heart. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pour out your love in our midst. We pray that you choose a new pastor to lead this community of faith. Form us to listen faithfully and speak honestly in our ministry together. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We remember with thanksgiving all your beloved saints, as you have raised them to eternal life, abide with us in your promise of resurrection. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Rejoicing in the victory of Christ's resurrection, we lift our prayers and praise to you, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Holy God, mighty Lord, gracious Father, endless is your mercy and eternal your reign. You filled all creation with light and life. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Through Abraham, you promised to bless all nations. You rescued Israel, your chosen people. Through the prophets, you renewed your promise, and at the end of all the ages, you sent your son Jesus, who in words, and deeds proclaimed your kingdom and was obedient to your will. And so we remember that in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper he took the cup he gave thanks and he gave it to them saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Therefore, gracious Father, with this cup, and bread, we remember the life our Lord offered for us. And believing the witness of his resurrection, we await his coming in power to share with us the great and promised feast. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Send now, we pray, your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of our Lord and of his resurrection, 
that we may receive the Lord's body and blood, may live to the praise of your glory, and receive our inheritance with all your saints in light. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Join our prayers with those of your servants of every time and every place, and unite them with the ceaseless petitions of our great high priest until he comes as victorious Lord of all. Gathered together by the Holy Spirit, we sing the prayer our Savior taught us. Come to the table where all are welcome. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of those whom you have fed with one heavenly food, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of our risen Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go out and be Easter people. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Let's sing Hallelujah. We sing your praises. Go in peace and share the good news. Thanks be to God. <laughs>